You are live. Good afternoon and welcome to the May meeting of the Public Art and Cultural Commission. I'm Chair Katie Cornell. The Public Art and Cultural Commission, originally called the Public Art Board, was established by Asheville City Council in 2000. This nine member commission serves as an advisory board to the city on matters concerning art in public spaces. The commission is responsible for promoting public art in the city, overseeing the city's public art projects, and ensuring that dis art displays in public buildings and public spaces in the city of Asheville are properly maintained. All committee members and staff are participating virtually. We're streaming live on our virtual engagement hub, which is accessible through the virtual Enga engagement hub link on the front page of the city website and on the city's YouTube page. To participate by phone, dial 855-925-2801, meeting code 9182. You can send public comments to Public Art and Cultural Commission at publicinput.com. Okay, I'll now go th through and do a roll call vote um, attendance. Um, so committee members, as I call your name, please say a quick hello. Shirley Whitesides is not here. We know Allie's not here. Andrew? Hello. Pete Perez? Hello. Joanna Haggerty? I'm here. <clears throat> Reggie Tidwell's not here. Pat Kappas? Hello. And Marsha Almodovar is not here. Okay. So, first uh, item on our agenda is under administrative items is minutes from our March meeting. Does there, everybody have a chance to review those minutes? Any changes? They look good? Yep. Okay. Now go through and do a roll call vote for the meeting minutes. So Andrew Fletcher, do you approve? Aye. Pete Perez? Aye. Joanna Haggerty? Aye. Pat Kappas? Aye. And I also approve. So we are going to move on to staffing updates. Big news, Carly had a little boy on May 6th. His name is Ellis. And so she is out on maternity leave right now. And um, new team member, um, Ellie, is joining us and will be working with the Public Art and Cultural Commission. Ellie, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ellie. I'm uh, working as a long range planner and I started in January and yeah, hopefully I'll be helping out with this commission in the future and I'll be taking notes. Wonderful, welcome. Hi, Ellie. So um, next is to talk about vacancies, appointments and elections. So I'll hand it over um, to Steph, but I just wanted to mention um, before I hand it over to Steph that Reggie and Marsha have decided not to be reappointed. Um, and so we are down to seven members. Um, and um, the city has moved to appointing new members to commissions on a quarterly basis. So new members would not be reappointed to this group until October. And so for that reason, Andrew and I, as it says in our bylaws, can stay on until the, our positions are filled. And so we'll sit We'll continue to sit on the committee until October. I just wanted to explain that. All right, it's all you, Steph. Great. And I just wanted to say from um, all of us, thank you, Katie and Andrew, for, um, for staying on. That provides a lot of historical continuity for us. And I think since we're having elections today and we seem to probably, it looks like we'll be getting a new chair and a vice chair, uh, for this commission that you guys will be in a great position to help mentor and provide support as that new team comes on. Thank you very much for that. Uh, as Katie noted, there will be vacancies now re-advertised. So there will be four seats advertised instead of the two seats. I just want to remind you all that the conversations that I have heard, what you all were looking for was somebody with either a strong public art background and delivering a multiple variety of projects and working with communities, 
a strong arts administrator background, somebody who's um, uh, working in arts organizations. Um, and then the third one would be someone with a strong, um, bringing a strong other kind of diversity to the commission. And that can look like anything from a diversity in what they do. Maybe they're a specific kind of musician or artist, or they are able to bring a diverse network or they have a diverse background. Maybe that's their racial, ethnic, cultural background that um, helps expand this commission's ability to work with the community and really represent with, um, with yourselves as a team. So that said, the, the city's clerk's office and our office is asking you to please consider providing um, us with some uh, outreach help and think big. I don't want you to think right now. I want you to think after we have a conversation about what the pack should be in the future a little bit later. We're gonna talk about how this might um, be improved what you might need. And then you can think about who should I call or send an email to or talk to next time we have lunch about getting on this board. And as Katie said, appointments would be made in October, but the application end date is going to be at the end of August. So you have a couple months to be strategic about this. That said, um, any questions about the vacancies? Okay. So I'm going to move ahead into um, elections. We're going to have a, um, thank you for joining, Marsha. We are going to have uh, annual elections now. Um, if anyone uh, looked at the agenda, I need to make a few corrections on it that have been discussed with members in advance. Um, for preliminary nominations for chair, and this is going to be a roll call vote, by the way, and, and I will do the roll call. Um, for preliminary nominations for chair, um, Shirley Whitesides and Pat Kappas have asked for their nominations to um, be removed. So the remaining nomination for chair person is Joanna Haggerty. And preliminary nominations for vice chair um, Pete Perez and Shirley Whitesides ha have asked for those nominations to be removed. So our nomination for vice chair is Allie McGee. Does anyone have any additional nominations for the position of chair? Does anyone have any additional nominations for the position of vice chair? Well, I'm just curious, too, because I just found out that you guys are staying on until October, which is so great and helpful. Does it make sense to discuss you guys staying in the positions you're in? I mean, I kind of, you know, I, is that something that should be on the table for discussion? I just, I don't know. I want to be respectful of, you know, the experience you have and what you've brought to the table. So I just wasn't sure anybody's thoughts on that. <laughs> I have provided my staff input on that, and which is that, you know, elections need to be done on an annual basis. And um, I think Katie and Andrew are in a great position to provide the next chair and vice chair with mentorship and help and to have that transition happen now instead of when they're gone. But I would like Katie and Andrew to also speak to their feelings and their best thoughts on it. I mean, I, I'll, I'm happy to go first, uh, Steph. I I agree. I mean, if there if we know that there's going to be a transition, you know, using the overlap um, as a way to uh, you know have a smoother transition, I think is um, you know I, I'm I'm very supportive of it. But you know, if if asked to fill in for the remaining of my term, I, I'm not going to say no. But I'm I'm happy to to um, uh, sort of be more forward thinking about the future and help smooth that transition by stepping aside. <laughs> I agree. I'm, I've been in this position for a long time now and I'm really ready to be done with it. <laughs> and I'm here to provide guidance. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure the conversation was had because it was sort of just something new that, you know, hadn't been discussed together as a team. And like I said, I, we didn't really get a chance to talk about nominations or anything 
Um, but I am the kind of person who gets a little nerdy and hungry for this kind of stuff. So I'm happy to learn from Katie and and take it on. I just, again, wanted to just have the discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Just want to acknowledge both Shirley Whitesides and um, Marsha Almodovar have um, joined the meeting. So we have uh, two more people in attendance and that will be reflected in the records. And I am going to do a roll call vote now for the position of chair. The nomination um, for chairperson is Joanna Haggerty. How do you vote? Pete Perez. Yes. Joanna Haggerty. Yes. Joanna, how would you like to vote on this nomination oh, of yourself? You're asking me, sorry. I am. I wasn't just saying your name again. I was like, Thank you. To say, yes, I will happily vote for myself. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Pat Kappas, how will you vote? I will also happily vote for Joanna. Okay. Marsha, your vote? Yep. Shirley Whitesides? Yes. Andrew Fletcher? Yes. Katie? Yes. Okay, we have a unanimous vote in favor of Joanna Haggerty, who will now be our new chairperson starting at the end of this meeting. So any um, additional uh, communications that we have in the website, for example, and any email that will all be changed to reflect that at the end of this meeting. I will now proceed with the election for a new vice chair. The nomination for vice chair is Allie McGee. How would you vote Pete Perez? Yes. Shirley Whitesides? Yes. Joanna Haggerty? Yes. Pat? Yes. Marsha? Yep. Andrew? Yes. And Katie? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. There has been a unanimous vote to have Ali McGee become the new vice chair of the Public Art and Cultural Commission. And that ends our uh, annual elections. All right. Steph, are we ready to move on to old business? I am. Would you like me to? Um, yeah, I'm just going to hand it right back over to you to give us an update on the Pack Square Plaza visioning. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So Pack Square uh, Plaza visioning um, draft document should have been released by now. And uh, we had some delays with um illnesses and people being out of office with our consulting team. And we do not yet have the final draft in our possession to be able to share with the community. So we wanted to update you to say that things are, um, things are still going to are going along. There's no major problems. We just want to take the time that is necessary to make sure that the draft plan is in good shape before we release it to the community. And the current schedule now looks like um, we will <clears throat> um, deliver that draft plan on July 7th, and we will go to city council on September 12th. So in between those dates, we will be having community advisory committee meetings. We will be talking with the downtown commission, we will be going to um, Planning and Economic Development Committee of City Council. We will be having a public online meeting. We'll be having a 24-7 publicinput.com um, engagement with the community on different parts. And then before, we'll get a, as much comment as we can. And then two weeks in advance of City Council, we'll be making any um, adjustments or last tweaks that are necessary to, for the council's consideration of that plan for adoption. Um, but that is, that is my update. It's mostly about the schedule. Are there any questions about that? When did you say it would go to city council? Again, let me look. September 12th.
Okay, the second item on our updates are, um, or it's just one update, and it is to talk about uh, an item that we had on last month, but we canceled, which is we had a developer for 50 Collier uh, request to potentially meet with members of the Public Art and Cultural Commission or come to the meeting and share their ideas for public art. This is a hotel, a boutique hotel that's on the location, the site just south of Burial Brewing where the Melchin Wake Sculpture was. And after discussion with this developer, it became clear that they were under, um, they, they were misunderstanding some of their development requirements and thought that they needed to create a specific piece of public art as part of the requirements, which they do not. However, they still plan on working, um, they already are, working with an artist to create some metal panels. Um, and I gave them some of my feedback um, as far as employing different artists to use um, for those metal panels and how to potentially reflect the changing nature of the district as a district that has a, <clears throat> a lot of local breweries and manufacturing in it, and potentially also reflect the historic nature of that neighborhood as part of the South Side neighborhood. So I believe they're taking that into consideration with their artists, um, but they won't be coming through the Public Art and Cultural Commission um, at this time. Any questions about that project, 50 Collier? No, I, I do think it would be uh, just interesting as a matter of course for updates, when there is a public art component to these developments, even if they're happening without our input, if they're part of the development process that's required, um, you know, an update here about what's going on, I think would be would be really helpful. And it, it doesn't have to be, I think, um, uh, you know, complex or super thorough, but, um, uh, you know, a brief agenda item on on how the development proposals that include public art are being fulfilled, I think would be helpful. You bet. Okay, that concludes that um, that business. And I believe now that we're going to move on to new business and I'm going to toss it back to Katie. And then we're going to share some of this next section together. Mm. Okay, so um, as you guys might remember from our last few retreats, we've had multiple discussions on the fact that our ordinance is way out of date. Still has us under Parks and Rec. Um, and so we talked about at this past retreat, updating our ordinance as a good um, first step. And so I've worked with the staff to start drafting a proposal for a new ordinance, which is linked in your agenda. Um, and it incorporates some of the different pieces that we've been discussing. And so I wanted to run it by all of you um, for your input before we move any further. And so basically this would be an update from the last um, ordinance change, which happened in 2011. Um, it would change kind of the focus of the group to be a, a bit more expansive. So it would be Public Art History and Cultural Culture Commission. Um, and that incorporates some of the other pieces that we've talked about, like outdoor events uh, on public space. So um, Steph, how did you wanna proceed with this discussion? So I, I thought I would just point out a couple things that aren't changed in the ordinance yet, but that um, as we move forward that the group could consider, if that's all right. Everybody's okay with that? Great. So um, as Katie noted, there is a, a consideration on the table to expand the purview of the commission and make it reflect a little bit more of what Asheville in the region is all about regarding creative commerce and um, uh, our social investments in culture, history, and arts instead of just public art. And that would be reflected not only in the name, which we kind of put in there, but also in a section um, 
the composition of the members, which we haven't changed yet, and we might want to talk about. And also when we talk about what some of the functions are. So for example, if we were to expand this commission and say, we want this commission now to be able to help the city of Asheville understand how to manage public resources when it comes to supporting festivals and special events. We would then look at the composition of this and say, perhaps it's important to reserve a seat for someone who is um, an event producer or someone that has extensive experience in working with organizations that produce um, special events. So that would be a potential change. Similarly, um, if we were to include um, history in this commission and be able to advise the city on certain things like investments we might make in preservation, especially cultural preservation um, assets. Um, we all know like for instance, the urban trail is a great example of, is it really history and storytelling or is it public art? kind of bleeds between both things. We may want to reserve a seat for someone who is a historian who has a special who has demonstrated special interest and expertise in history. So the first thing I wanted to get feedback from you all about is this big picture idea of expanding the purview of the commission so that the purpose of the commission now includes, um, special events, cultural events, and history. Any thoughts on that? I mean, I think, not that this would impact me, but I feel like if people have the capacity, like what does that time-wise look like for a person on the commission? Ooh, great example. So you mean like commitment, does it increase their level of commitment to spend more time? Great question. And I'm gonna consider it a rhetorical one right now. I'm not gonna answer, but other people might wanna chime in on it. Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in. I'll just say that there's, you know, there's amount of, I think that it's a good question, you know, like what's the input? But if the input is matched by an increased output, then I think people are going to say, well, yeah, it takes it takes so much time, but we're getting more done. And I, th I think that's probably that most people would probably consider that to be worth it. Um, uh, if it's more input, but not more output. Right. If we're not getting more done as a group, um, uh, but we're being asked for for time, that doesn't seem like a good deal. But it, it's to me, it's all about or people putting in more, what people are putting in and what we're getting out as a, as a, as a group and as um, an organ of the city. So um, as long as those two things, as long as the math on those two things is good and it's well-constructed, I, I personally having spent time and served, you know, would be, would be happy to be asked for a little bit more if I knew that we were going to be getting a lot more. Okay, and you can continue to comment on these, but I'm going to move on to just some something um, specific. Then, can you I, know, can I ask yeah. a question: Is there another commission that deals with historical resources currently? There is a commission whose job it is to provide certificates of appropriateness for um, any projects that happen in local historic districts. So, the Historic Resources Commission also approves plans like um, if we have a preservation master plan, they would approve something like that. And uh, they do provide input on certain projects like uh, the master plan for the Thomas Wolf cabin. So but they're not fo focused on cultural assets. Not necessarily, no. I mean, more explicitly architectural history is what they're is what they're dealing with right in, in in a more of a narrowest in in just in that silo right but the, the history and the context we're talking about here is much broader i would say it is much broader and it is you're probably right then it's dealing a lot more with programmatical aspects 
And it's something that I would say that I would write down as a note, as maybe a question as to like, what would be the delineation between HRC? Similarly, um, one of the reasons this came up is that in some of the conversations that we've had in the past couple of years and that have also been had at the African American Heritage Commission, there's been a discussion of whether or not the African American Heritage Commission shouldn't just partner with you all in a more active way. And instead of, I think they don't want to be dissolved necessarily, but, um, and I don't think the Public Art Commission would want to be dissolved either. But there is an opportunity to consider it not a dissolution of either board, but perhaps the creation of a, something that is larger than the sum of its parts, right? By combining the type of experts um, and interests that are involved in one with the other. Peanut butter chocolate type of thing. So regardless, let's just put this to say, if we if we put changing the purview of the ordinance aside and we were just to say, let's just keep it public art for now, just public art. Um, the What you would see in this ordinance is at least under that kind of auspice, the attempt to add one seat so that arts abl the the area arts council is always a standing member of this commission and that is something that we see in other boards like for example the downtown commission has the downtown association seat right and then we also have proposed adding um someone from the buncombe county tourism development authority so what we what we haven't said is whether or not that per it says it in here, but what we haven't decided is whether or not that person should be staff or a board member, or if it should just be at the discretion of the appointing board for the downtown association. It is at the discretion of the appointing board what they done for many years as they would just have their executive director sit on that seat. Um, and right now the downtown association they don't have an executive director. So in the interim, they've asked a member of their board to sit on that seat. It gives them that kind of flexibility. So just getting back to public art and cultural commission membership, any thoughts from you all on the proposal for um, those two standing seats? Do those two make sense? Should there be others? I'm supportive of those of both those positions and also allowing the organizations to use discretion as far as who they appoint. Um, that could be it could be certain work. You know, they can change that really quickly as needed. If they have if there's a certain type of project that's before the board and they need to send someone that has a special expertise or background on it, it if they have the discretion to send that person who is taking point on that thing, that's you know, that that's great. I don't want to think, you know, think uh, for them in that place, but offer, offer them the flexibility to fill that role as they see fit. That's where I'd be as well, Steph. Both positions sound logical and having the flexibility because all organizations have been flowed depending on who's available, what time they have, what the issues are they're working on. I think the continuity between thinking, planning, and getting things done could really be better with this type of relationship. Has anybody discussed with the Buncombe County Tourism Development Authority this specifically yet, or? I have. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was gonna say, I definitely know it's been tossed out over the last year or so, a couple of okay. times. And I'm writing down thinking, planning, and getting things done because I really love that framework and I think that will come in handy in a second when we move on to the next little discussion. Yeah, and I think just to offer a thought on the prior conversation, Stephanie, I think if we broaden our scope and what it is that we're doing, uh, at times we've really struggled with maintaining focus. And if we broaden our charter, we're putting that at risk. And then it's also going to put a premium on making sure that we have all the open commission seats filled. 
Um, otherwise, we put ourselves in danger of, of being overloaded. And I mean, I, I like the idea, but I think it's going to put a premium on us to be more focused about what it is we're doing and be very clear about our priorities. Very good point. So I'm going to move this. I was feeling the same way, but he just summed up. Yeah, I think it's really important, especially the history part, like we've been talking about, getting really clear on what our role with that would look like. And again, I think tasking these different, you know, working groups or whatever we're going to call them can be really powerful if we know how to really activate that. But yeah, not scoping too broad and making sure we're attaining goals is really important, I think, for everybody who is staying on the board, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I would remark that, you know, the urban trail deals so much with history that part of it is already within the purview. And so th that's why this doesn't, to me, it doesn't feel like a like a really a new mandate. It's just a sort of formalizing some of the stuff that we've been tasked with and, you know, hasn't and, you know, is honestly in need of an update um, in many cases on the urban trail. If this if this is a mandate to help to help um, uh, freshen that up and um, uh, with some contemporary sensibilities and context, um, you know, then that I'm, I'm supportive of. But I, I agree, you have to be careful when you broaden the mandate. But I, I kind of feel that the work has already been in, gone in that direction for a very long time with the urban trail. And so I, that's why it doesn't maybe as, I don't see it as, as like a real revolutionary expansion. Um, uh, and so I am comfortable with it. But I would, I, I'm also hesitant of, you know, getting too broad and, and um, not being able to go deep on things. Yeah, I think I think to build on that, Andrew, depending on who put, tries to put things on our agenda, clearly getting alignment with that urban trail. We've been talking about that, I know, since I've been on board and before I've come on, that's something that we have to make happen. So that's really a good point. And yeah, redefining the focus of what we're doing, I think, as Andrew said, could allow for more strategy and more impact. But just being really thoughtful about the process feels important. Great. Well, at our last meeting, you all were able to see some of the longer and outstanding needs that we had in the program. You all um, unanimously um, approved about $80,000 to be used for some administrative items. And that was anything from training of public artists to get people in to help um, overhaul the uh, policy um, and, and get that more in line. So I just wanted to remind you all that that, that is, um, that is a, a big thing that we'll be looking, staff will be looking to y'all to help with um, in the next year as we move forward. When we think about um, other ways that the public art program could be optimized, I just wanted to share a couple little staff ideas to get your your um, your, your thoughts moving. And then I'm going to ask you to go through pretty quick strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats exercise with me. So based on my observations, um, working with communities and kind of trying to pull myself up and, and um, have other staff look from a 30,000 foot level of where this community is right now, we are now more than ever further away from just acquiring pieces of public art for the public art collection for the sake of having one. And from the conversations that we've been having, while we would like to acquire more public art, we would really like it to be tied more into goals. So those can be economic development goals, and those can be goals about community building, community development, and connecting into this bigger thing that is happening in our community, whether or not that might be looking at affordability, or looking at reparations, or looking at um, diversifying our economy. So that that said, and and that is that again, like you know, to borrow some of Andrew's verbiage here, like that is not actually groundbreaking or new. I think we have been talking about that for many years, and even in 2017, when the last PAC ordinance update or the policy updates happened, this was you know really acknowledged that we are in the business of 
placemaking is what that was put in there. But maybe what this commission is really in the business of is also community development. And the asset that we have that we maybe haven't been able to optimize its use for, ironically, is money. And that um, the way the ordinance is written now, it is it is very much in line with public art ordinances across the United States, which says that we put 1% of qualifying funds out for public art. And that money has got to be used to, and it has to be used on something that it looks like a duck that is art, right? Um, so that is a that is a conversation that I think when we start talking about broadening the scope of this commission, that also has to go hand in hand. Which is, is it you know how creative would this commission want to get with the use of public art funds for things like festivals and special events if they're if they have a foot in history, if they have a foot in culture, does it have to have two feet in culture for the public art funds to be able to use to support something like that? And then, um, so food for thought, something for y'all to think about is how are we supporting our communities with this, this money? And as you saw, you know, we have like a million dollars to spend. It's not, it's not inconsequential. Okay. Okay, so you want to be a successful organization in the next five years. At least those of you, you're going to serve for at least another three years, a bunch of you. You know, some of you have re-upped. Some of you might get appointed later on for because of your different seats where you're going to be supporting this organization. Before I ask you literally strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, I want you to pretend that you fall asleep tonight and you wake up five years from now and the front page of the newspaper, which that is such a dated saying for me to say, let's just say you open your laptop and you open it up to AVO watchdog or blade or something else. <laughs> you see this amazing article about the public art and cultural commission accomplishing something. What is it? What could it be? Well, I'll, I'll throw one out there. Uh, five years from now, um, uh, Public Art History and Cultural Commission <laughs> uh, celebrates ten million dollar of grant giving to arts organizations in five years. Nice headline. More diverse. Uh, arts in the community. Let's make it specific. Uh, Is it a more number? African American, yeah. Hispanic, Latino? Uh, help me out. Uh, Greek, more uh, public art representing all cultures, if possible. Represent yeah, we get a headline that says, finally, especially African American, represents all cultures with special focus on our Black community or something like that. Great headline. Yes. Pat oh, well. connects neighborhoods through community public art projects. I agree with Katie, and we're doing that through the Arts Council in Buncombe County, and it's really needed. Um, you wouldn't believe the experiences we are having here at Delta House. We've had the homeless to burn a fire on our porch. Mm. Uh, Joseph Pearson painting a rock in our yard and the homeless putting all their baggage in boxes. So that's why, and forgive my, uh, poor grandma the other night when I wrote, sent the email, but it's very stressful and something's got to be done. They run the people from downtown and they coming down South French Boy by the YWCA United Way and all around. And we're right over across from the River Arts District. And uh, we are community and maybe we need to do something to 
I don't want to get into the homeless, but we got to do something to make our community a better place. I think we all agree with you, Shirley. So we've got three headlines so far. Let's come up with at least one or two more. Five years from now. Um, uh, last public park. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm mentioning every public park having a dedicated piece of public art and that program being completed in five years so that every neighborhood has a piece of public art. Mm. City of Asheville supports and fosters public artists. How? More how youth. Are we, how do we prove it? Through training programs. Okay. <laughs> More youth are involved oh. in the arts. All okay, forms so of art. So we have three here that are great. So we have one that's like a housing program for for artists, right? We've got one that's more youth and then we've got one where we've trained public artists and i would say the the living space the live workspace i think is really valuable too because that can be yeah we had a close call with one of those a few years ago the art space folks and um hopefully that call. hopefully that will um that conversation can return someday all right, let me ask you about this. If there was a headline where there was some kind of partnership between the Public Art and Cultural Commission or the city's public art program and other organizations where like, it created some kind of mighty partnership, who would those partners look like? Buncombe County, the BCTDA, RCVO, the Community Foundation of Western North Carolina. UNC Asheville. Dogwood Foundation. Throw in AB Tech and Warren Wilson because they're close and friendly. I'd say places like MANA and OnTrack and places that artists need those types of resources. Um, perhaps a, a, a partnership with a rehabilitative program. Um, to, uh, you know, bring the unhoused or uh, formerly incarcerated into contact with the arts. The school board, Buncombe County and Asheville City. The jail systems. Nonprofit organization working with youth and adults. Asheville music professionals, though yeah. conflict of interest, I am on the board there, but you know. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's what the network is all about. <laughs> it'll be a it'll be a conflict of in interest. You can just re recuse yourself if need be from a, a vote if we if we give you money. <laughs> well, there's a cooperation of interest too that's necessary, and so right. I, those lines are always hard um, in a small community of such active folks like us, but I, I, I do want to be above board about all that, so. Neighborhood associations. Okay, I'm gonna read you what this might look like so far. This is gonna be our aspir this is some aspirational stuff that you, you pulled out in five minutes. Okay, so that would be, uh, um, Dateline, May 18th, 2028. Today, the Public Art and Cultural Commission celebrated spending $10 million uh, of public art funds given out to not-for-profit and local organizations through granting. They also said that they have met a goal of creating more diverse arts. Maybe they actually finally represent the full community and have a special focus on the black community here in Asheville. Public Art and Cultural Commission has connected neighborhoods through communi community public art projects, has worked with many neighborhood associations, partnering with AB Tech, Buncombe County, Buncombe County TDA, Arts ABL, the Community Foundation, UNC Asheville, 
Dogwood Foundation, Warren Wilson, partnerships with Asheville Music Projects. Um, they've also supported local artists by providing live workspaces and housing in a resource center with MANA and OnTrack as partners. The last neighborhood public park um, that didn't have a piece of public art now does. And we can say that every neighborhood is within 10 minute walking distance of a piece of public art. Uh, the next thing up on our plate is to start a rehabilitation um, cooperation program uh, where we work with people coming out of homelessness and potentially people coming out of the jail system to improve their lives and offer them economic and social opportunities through public art. We're also partnering with the schools and the school board this year. That sound good? Sound pretty good, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I think if you, yeah. fed, I think if you, we're going to do all it, that with no full time dedicated staff member. You are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You so not much. to. Sorry, sorry. So not to. Um. Uh, I I love what you've done. This is great. It was like the. It was like the most productive type of Mad Libs that I that I've done in a while. It was great. <laughs> I love it. Um. I also kind of want us to think about. I, I'd also like, you know, ask us to think about the nature of the word public in our title. Is it public because it's owned by the public? Is it because it's public accessible? Is it because it's funded by the public? Or is it intended to have a public function, even whether that when that function is not something that you can really observe publicly um, uh, or easily? Um, so, you know, the role of art within an individual, I think, is a public interest because it makes us um, interesting, well-rounded folks that um, uh, be, that can uh, partake of many more pieces of life and connect with many more uh, members of their community. And so I, I, the nature of that word public, I don't want it to, to, to get, to have, I'd like to have an expansive view of what the public in our, in that title can mean. Um, uh, and not just think about it, it's public because we have a public employee at this meeting. <clears throat> And that it is, uh, and that is, it is a, a much broader way of thinking about what the public portion of our of our title and our mandate means. So that is, that's 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 my big thirty thousand foot contribution there. It's a really good question. There's nothing to say, and I'm curious if there are other you know boards or commissions across the country that are commissions for arts, history, and culture, and then they just have a public art component, right? Because there is a value in, in, in saying, you know, we have a, a, a dedication for public art. We want people to be able to access it. We want it to be for all, right? That's the inclusivity part that, you know, but there's also a value of saying, and we also want to support arts for youth in a school. And that's not accessible by everybody, but that is, you know, a lot of value add and the city of Asheville surely does support programs, um, after school programs or through, you know, through support for, um, at the Asheville city schools, um, that are not accessible to everybody. Something to think about. I like it. But through, uh, community, uh, at the school programs, you're getting kids from all over the community. From you different walks are. of life, uh, there there's a need to really support, and uh, we having kids committing suicide, just like drinking milk, and that's awful. So we mm -hmm. need to do something in the community through organizations who are working with these kids to. Uh, help them feel good about themselves and uh, coping with life. And we don't know what they're experiencing at home or in their community. And that's why uh, it's important. And these are gonna be the citizens that are gonna be voting later on in five or 10 years or, or sooner than that. We need to think about those kids and 
uh, what they can help with the community and making it a better place. Yes. So we know we can't accomplish all of those things we talked about in five years, but um, there may be some of those things that could be accomplished, whether it's a partnership that addresses youth or it's an ability to work in a, through you know, all of our parks programming and, and make things more accessible for all people throughout the community. I want to just talk briefly about what those, um, and we all know strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Opportunities and threats are kind of the same as strengths and weaknesses, so we're just going to do strengths and weaknesses. And you can think of them as like strengths would be opportunities too. What are some of the strengths? Even if they're not super strong right now, they're things that could be strong with the Public Art Program or the Public Art and Cultural Commission. I'll give you one. We have money. I was going to say that one, but I'm glad you did. <laughs> oh. We have a community that is absolutely full of human capital and talent. Um, so that that is something that we have that is that is truly unique. Other other places, it's why I'm here. You know, it, it's it's why many of us are here is because of the the community of of talent and dedicated persons that are here that are just slim simply like outstrips almost any other community of our size anywhere in the country. I'll say we have a public art program and we have a percent for the art policy. So our, the backbone is there. I like the Urban Trail website. It's really user friendly. Cool. I would add that we have a strong um, level of support and community for arts investment in general. Extending what Andrew said and what you all provided me with partners. Um, and this, we have a community full of human capital and talent, but we also have a community full of amazing not-for-profits and organizations that we can partner with, like potential partners. I would like to say uh, because of one organization, the Arts Council, or Asheville, what is it, Asheville Art? Art CVL. Okay. Uh, it has made a difference in the community with nonprofit organizations to be able to do uh, programs that will uh, make a difference in the community, uh, working with youth and adults. And some of us are in awkward positions where you can't find go grab money like others can. And that has made a difference. And the, being have, having the opportunity to even like, we're doing a festival this coming weekend with Sekou Coleman and our jazz band playing. And uh, through these ev events, we are able to present, do something for the community that we didn't have the opportunity to do a couple of years ago. And uh, Special Art Bills community has been uh, a great support. And if we had more like that and the pot could be even greater, uh, we got to get out there and knock and get the right people involved so this can happen. And this is our youth. Remember, our youth will soon be adults. And when I, I taught a lot of kids and when I go around and I see them serving me where I go, I think about how I work with those kids. And we need to think about the future of the city and the county also. Yeah, I think to just piggyback on that was surely like arts are the activator, they're the galvanizer, they're the healer. So that's such the opportunity right now is to interject the money 
and programming support we have into the right places so that we can do all those things. Any other opportunities that we see out there? I think we have sort of make. a responsibility almost to make sure that when we are putting money, we are thinking about where the biggest need is, where the greatest impact can be had. It sometimes is easy in a small town to be like, oh, we know this organization. Oh, they've done this thing. But really being willing to take risks and see those things through is part of what arts is about too. So, you know, just really focusing on that inclusivity part. I liked sort of the convo we had about, it's not quite public art, it is more like inclusive art in ways which can include public art. So I think that's important to make sure we're not pigeonholing ourselves. Okay, so how about some of our threats, some of our weaknesses? Say Staff it, baby. Capacity. <laughs> 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 yep. Um, maintenance, um, as well as rethinking the pieces that we have. Um, Y'all jump on in here. There's plenty of them. <laughs> The bureaucracy and red tape can be really challenging. <laughs> I'd say overall, we've thrived as a as an artistic community much because we have a sort of a constant inflow, and the factors that affect that are really largely economic, mm. and that there if we we sort of need to have fresh talent showing up all the time and you know, people graduating from UNCA and deciding to stay here, um, but they need to be able to have the factors to do that. So I, I would so definitely say a threat is the local economy um, and people being able not to, people not being able to have the beginnings of their career in Asheville, but needing to go someplace else to start their rear career and coming here later in their career. So we need, we need fresh, we need fresh talent all the time. And big concern about that is the ec economic landscape. So that's, that's, that threats beyond our purview, we can kind of mitigate it, I think, in some places, but it's 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 an, it's a top of mind for for many people. I think another threat I'd say is just the competing priorities out there, um, whether it's housing, money. I mean, we're we're kind of running upstream where there's a lot of things that the city and county is having to face all at once and require uh, headcount. Uh, money, et cetera. And it's it's easy to kind of get lost in the haze with so many other things that are happening out there. I think this is a critical point, Pete. And um, I'd say aligning what this commission does with some of those other larger concerns might be a key to being successful in the next five years. You know, things that Shirley brought up, youth, some of our issues with mental health, the work, Marsha, I know you're embedded in it and know a lot about what's going on in our community right now. Everybody is, I'm just thinking, Marsha is doing the work every day, I know. So we all see it. But I think that's right, Steph. I, when, I, when I look at a big opportunity for it, it's like, how do we better leverage our partnership with the large organizations that we rattled and named off and become a cohesive group that's pulled it together. When I look at, you know, Shirley talking about what happened with Arts ABL, a lot of that work was around being able to farm up and make sure that we're very clear about everybody's needs. How do we pull it together so we don't get stuck just operating out of this group of people, but that we've got kind of a higher vision of what do we do to kind of coalesce, um, you know, merging agendas and to be able to get a number of people on the same page for one voice you know, looking for either initiatives or money or both as we go forward. We did a mini orientation for the Riverfront Commission the other day, and this came up um, a lot. It came up in the sense of alignment 
right? Like how can we align more to get things done? Um, and then it also came up in this in the discussion really about um, as much as we have a staff capacity issue, the competing priorities is also on the board member side, right? And so board members, one of the first questions that was asked was if we expanded the purview or change the commission somehow, how would that change the amount of time people could spend? And we know that everybody's got other work to do. That's and right. so um, how do we optimize an ordinance or some kind of strategic operating plan for the Public Art and Cultural Commission that people will easily be able to dig into it and do some of the work, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other top of mind um, weaknesses or threats to a really successful public art program, public art and cultural commission? I had to step away for a sec, so forgive me if I repeat any thoughts. Um, you know, the uh, AVL arts or arts AVL has been run so well, but when I was there, it was a different story, right? Just to speak frankly and honestly, um, I would think it would be important to like have regular conversations just to make sure that the organizations who have the board seats are the ones who are still doing that work. You know, there were times that the Arts Council wasn't actually granting money out. So if that shifted at some point, and again, not anticipating that happening, <laughs> um, but just making sure that we're considering who are the right players. Maybe we review that every certain amount of time um, and just make sure that, you know, the right players are at the table too, moving forward. So smart. And, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you what I, what I wrote down was not auditing and not evaluating as a threat um, because sometimes we create these ordinances and then 10 years later we say, why is this person on the board? They have no connection to this anymore whatsoever. So smart call. So technically we are supposed to re review and readopt the public art plan every five years, but it just became so outdated. <laughs> And disassociated well with what we were actually doing that it that hasn't happened. But there is uh, some kind of structure in place for that continuous review already. Katie, isn't um isn't there this thing called the, the arts organization of record for like or something like that for every community? And that so is we the, are yeah the designation. So every county has a designated arts ag agency which is designated by the county. So we have an official resolution with Buncombe County. We are the designated arts agency for Buncombe County. So we and for the people at home, when you say we, explain their oh, you know, yeah. arts AVL. And that's why I was saying we had lost it at the time I was there. That had been removed for a couple of years. And so I just think it's important that that can shift at some point. So. No, the funding from the North Carolina Arts Council had the designation had not. So. Uh -huh. Okay, this was very, very good input. And then here's here's what we're gonna do from here. So at this point, your mind should be like worrying, worrying, like W H I R R, not worrying, worrying, like a a, a nice little motor thinking about like, hush, what do, should we change anything? Should we make things tighter? Should we expand it? Who should be on this board? And what is it that we can actually accomplish? Because we need, you know, we need kind of a dedicated staff, but we need dedicated board members as well who are able to, board members who are not just willing, but able to. And sometimes that's because of the positions they have because they already work in an arts organization or they're a great project manager or something like that, able to help see some things through. So Ellie and I are gonna go back and we're gonna get these notes together and we are going to resend out this ordinance. And what I would like for you to do is, with all of this in mind, just provide some commentary on this ordinance. And it doesn't have to be on the exact words that are in here. It can literally just be you highlighting a ordinance number XXXX and commenting and saying, 
I think we should get up and only do one thing. And it's this one thing or whatever you think. Okay. Um, and right now, just as a reminder, you are only meeting on a bi-monthly basis. Next month, it will look like the new executive team getting together with the old executive team and staff and having a conversation. We're going to have a conversation not only about the agenda for, for our next meeting, but also about this ordinance and it's just some get some thoughts uh on paper from the feedback that you have provided so that we can feed it back to you to consider that that meeting what else needs to happen um uh, i just want to make sure that buncombe county was listed in our potential list of partners was it i just okay good just double, double checking the first, it. that was the first one i listed that's why I didn't think of it by the time we got through that list. Thank you. I just wanted to, I wanted it's to make It's quite sure. a list. Yeah. So right. there's no more comments on new business. Did everybody feel like we, we ended that conversation in a good place? Okay. Um, do we have any public comment? Who am I asking? You're asking Dana and she's for checking right now. Okay. I think the answer is no, you do not have any public comment. Correct. The answer is no public comment. Sorry for the delay. No worries. Thanks, Dana. So seeing there's no public comment, we'll move on to updates and announcements. So we'll do our around the table if there's anything you'd like to share with the group. I'll start. I'll model this. So tonight is Mosaic Realty's Art Walk downtown. I and mean, probably a bunch of you have seen this, that there's 12 not-for-profits and 12 galleries, and they've partnered that up. And there's a lot of raffle tickets that you can buy um, to support these not-for-profit organizations and have a variety of different prizes. But it's, I think, a pretty great way to get people to come out and to some of the galleries downtown. Um, uh, a nice type of marketing effort that we could emulate sometime. Um, I'm performing every Tuesday this month um, at the Double Crown in West Asheville. Mm. So come out and get some jazz if anybody would like some. Um, also, uh, always encouraging folks to sign up for the Asheville Music Professionals email newsletter uh, because we're doing uh, we're doing events about every single month, and they're either fun or informative or both. So um, uh, if you just like to hang out with a bunch of musicians, um, uh, uh, you are all you are all welcome. And uh, so it's, but sign up for those newsletters. It's a great way for us to keep connected. Shirley, did you say you had an event coming up this weekend? Seiku Coleman's event. It's on uh, Sweeten Creek. It's Sunday. It's from 12 to 7 p.m. And now jazz band is going to perform at 3.30 for 30 minutes. And uh, they having food trucks and vendors. And uh, they asked us if we would perform. So we've been collaborating. I think they changed their name. It used mm -hmm. to be Word on the Street. So we do a lot of collaboration. And uh, hopefully we're planning our Art Bill community June 2nd. I want to finalize everything. Mm -hmm. And it'll either be at Delta House or Asheville Middle School baseball field. So um, I will let everybody know. And we will have uh, performers, art exhibits, and uh, a chance to get the parents out and uh, sign the kids up for summer camp. Uh, through our 21st century program, we have a six weeks program and uh, it's called Exploring Our Community Community Through Art and History. And so uh, we want the kids to learn more about the community and explore some of the arts that uh, the people have done here in Asheville. And uh, so we're trying to keep, keep it going and uh, we gotta keep our kids involved, I mean, and we have a, oh, this is being recorded. I start to say we have a crazy state 
things are changing very crazy and uh we got to protect our kids so let's see it i have an art show coming up or opening on saturday um from six to nine at bottle riot and it'll be up till the end of july so come check it out we have a lot of latinx fun vibes happening on saturday oh and delta house jazz band will be performing at uh juneteenth celebration uh june 17th downtown in the in the park we have a 45 minute step we're just gonna say um it was really great to see the uh trolley that uh, Arts AVL started um, in River Arts District last weekend. So congratulations. Thank you. And thanks for all your help, Pat, and getting that off the ground. It took a while, but we did it. <laughs> yeah, it was great, you guys. We A bunch of us rode it on Saturday. And I, I love seeing people were taking it literally for transportation purposes. So um, it's great. I and, want to, oh, sorry, Shirley, I just want to say thank you for calling crazy, crazy, public meeting or not, crazy is crazy, and you say it. I mean, I'm, I'm a, really, I'm really serious, and when you look at the TV program, that's all they're talking about is now what's happening to our kids. I don't want to get political, and it hurt me and my organization. I don't want another fire, but I'm just speaking out. It's crazy. Shirley, since you brought up the Arts Book Community Grant, I did want to say that it, it is open right now. We are accepting, accepting applications for arts-based community projects in Buncombe County, and will be open until June 15th. Um, and this is for um, the next fiscal year, so July 1 through June 30 of this upcoming year. Katie, are you going to be able to um, announce the project that's happening um, on Hilliard? Oh, um, so part of um, Buncombe County is doing an equity murals project. Um, and they picked three finalists. And one of the finalists um, is doing a project on Hilliard and will hopefully be starting later this month. <laughs> um, but uh, Leslie's project focuses on the Latinx community and um, it's really amazing. So we are her fiscal agent um, trying to help an up and coming artist be able to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, so um, it's been um, a lot of fun and a lot of learning so far, um, but we're really excited to see it underway soon. Yay for more public art. Sounds like every, everyone's gone around the table that wanted to speak. All right, so the next meeting, as Steph said, is in July. July 20th, and um, if nobody has anything further to say, I will call this meeting adjourned for the last time. <laughs> Thanks, all. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Good night.